Hi everyone, this is Cody Bonham of Block and Knife Crafts. You can find me on Instagram and Etsy. Um, joining you today with the International Association of Woodcarvers. All right, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, today is Saturday, the 18th of May, 2023. Or I'm sorry, 2024. Getting behind myself there a little bit. Um, a little bit after 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I uh, want to welcome you all into the International Association of Woodcarvers, where woodcarvers are helping woodcarvers. Um, hopefully, where you are, it's not raining like it is in Tennessee. Uh, I'm thinking that maybe I need to start building an ark because it's rained so much in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but hopefully, it's dry where you are today. But I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to come in and join us. Um, today on our meeting, we're going to have Cody Bonham sharing with us. Um, he's coming to us from Kansas. Before we get started with him, I want to tell you a little bit about some stuff that's coming up here just uh, shortly. Um, next week on our meeting, we're going to have uh, Reese from Woody Wood Spirits is going to be back in with us. He's presented with us before. He's going to be on next Saturday. Uh, after next Saturday, we're going to start our summer series. And th those of you who followed along with this through the years, uh, during the summer, because it's so busy, people are doing um, different things like vacations and things like that. We drop back to one meeting a month, and that's June, July, August. Uh, so we'll have a meeting in June on the 22nd of June. Um, Rick uh, Gajusa, and I can't pronounce his name, that's uh, coming to us from England. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, you can go out and look on Instagram. His handle there is Scarecrow Woodcrafts. Uh, he travels around and plays music, but he also uh, is a wood carver and teaches wood carving. Uh, so he should have an interesting story. He'll come in on the 22nd of uh, June. Um, Want to let you know about some workshops that's coming up. Again, Dave Stetson has a workshop that's going to be starting on June the 1st. I think he is still taking um, students. So if you're interested in that, you better reach out to him quick so that he can get you the materials that you need uh, to get signed up. Um, it starts on June the 1st. It's on wood carving at Five Piece Cowboy and Friends. Uh, so, again, reach out to Dave. Uh, he can give you all the information about that. Uh, and then Janet Cordell is going to be teaching a class in August. Um, she's going to teach a class on a horse jumping a fence. Uh, if you're familiar with Janet's work, her work's fantastic. She's a great teacher. Uh, she's been on with us in the past. Uh, so, if you're interested in Janet's class, contact her. Get signed up. Again, it's August the 5th. I uh, want to remind you all about the uh, the show coming up in Colorado Springs in September. Uh, the CCA will be doing their Carving the Rockies show uh, September uh, 14th and 15th up in Colorado Springs. Uh, we also have a caricature carving uh, class. Uh, it's actually three days of classes. Uh, if you're interested in signing up for those, go out to the CCA website, uh, get signed up. You can see all the information there about what's going on that weekend. Uh, and really for the um, for the classes as well. Uh, so make sure you go out to the CCA website, and check it out. Um, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Dave Stetson, who uh, usually shares our words of wits, wisdom. And Dave, I'll go ahead and give you the mic. Thank you, Blake. Um, this is something I came across this past week, and uh, it caused me to uh, reflect on on it and ask myself a question what i heard was that wise men talk because they have something to say fools because they have to say something now, i had to write that down so i would wouldn't get it screwed up but uh i had to ask which one am i so i'll pass that on which one are you Again, wise men talk because they have something to say and fools because they have to say something. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate that. Definitely something to ponder there. Uh, appreciate Dave coming in each week and having something prepared to share with us uh, that keeps us motivated, gives us some insight, and uh, uh, it's definitely something that, um, that I look forward to. So thank you, Dave, on that. Uh, again, today we've got Cody Bonham on with us. He's coming to us from Kansas. You can find him on Instagram as Block and Knife. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his carving journey, kind of what got him started and what he, what he likes to do. He's going to do a screen share and show us some of his work. 
and talk us through that. So, Cody, I appreciate you coming on today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of talk about how I got started, um, my process of carving. I'll show you some carvings, and I have my uh, chat up if you all have any questions, because I might run out of stuff to talk about. But uh, I began carving in 2020 um, when the world was shut down and uh, people were going stir crazy in their homes. Um, I remember back to a time when I was younger, my grandpa gave me a whittling knife at one time when I was probably seven or eight years old. And I whittled a, a baseball bat and a ball out of a piece of wood and couldn't tell you whatever happened to that knife after that point. And I never really thought about it again, but uh, I did have some woodworking experience um, growing up in my church. We had a group called the Royal Ambassadors. So it was kind of like Boy Scouts. So we did the Pinewood Derby cars and a little bit of carving, um, you know, maybe a point on a stick or something like that, or carving a walking stick. Um, middle school, I took wood shop, which I loved. And that teacher was actually a wood carver that I've gotten back into touch with over the last few years here in town. Um, in high school, well, really in all through school, I did art, but it was mostly drawing and painting. But I had a, a teacher in high school because I was also a football player. And she told me I need to either choose art or sports that I didn't have time to do both. And unfortunately, I gave up on art in high school, even though it's something I really loved, but I loved football more at the time. Um, so I really went probably 15 years without doing any kind of art aside from maybe drawing with my kids at home and stuff like that um, until I discovered wood carving. And I, I don't even know exactly what prompted it. Maybe it's something I saw scrolling through Instagram, but I started doing some research and of course watching YouTube videos like a lot of people get the start. So I ended up buying a Beavercraft knife set. It came with three different knives um, and a low leather strop. And one of the first pieces I did, I don't know if you can see in the light very well, maybe. It's a Sharon My Art little man. You probably know her YouTube channel. Then progressed on to Doug Linker's Hobo. So those are one of my first two I ever did. Um, and I just got addicted with it. But I had gotten addicted to other hobbies beforehand, so I wasn't sure if this one would really stick. And it's something that kind of drove my wife crazy. I got into golf for a while and spent a lot of money on golf stuff. and eventually got bored of it and I spent a couple years obsessed with ultra trail running. If you're not familiar with that, it's distances over a marathon. So like 50 kilometer races, 100 kilometer races. But after a couple years of that, I got burnt out. And so my next obsession was wood carving and it's been almost five years now. So I can say I, I beat the, the trend before that. So um yeah most of what i learned was on youtube i watched doug linker sharing my art i've watched some of blake's videos um with the santa the beard stuff like that um alec lacasse or lacase i'm not sure how you say it his videos are awesome um van jones videos are awesome he's kind of uh, newer on on youtube but yeah, that's where I, I learned. I never took any classes. Um, everything was on just learning from videos. Um, but since then, I got in touch with a couple people here in town um, that I've been to their house and seen their setups and carved with them. And that's helpful to learn some from them. Um, and then I have a group of people in just outside of the town that I met and the way I met them was I was at an art show and I saw a woman wood carving and I was like, wow, that's awesome. Cause I never see anyone in town wood carving, especially at these art shows. So I got into contact with her and she said, yeah, we have this little group that meets once a month. 
And so I started joining them and it's, I would say the majority of the ladies there are 60 and older. And there's one gentleman that's uh, retirement age. And then um, there's one girl that's middle school age that had just started learning um, and then me. So it's definitely an older crowd, but they have so much experience and they've taught me a lot. Just if you can get into a group of people locally, I think that's huge because seeing stuff in a video is one thing, but actually getting hands-on practices will take it to the next level. Um, so I guess um, the reason I started was just out of boredom um, during the pandemic, but it's really been a great stress reliever for me. Um, I suffer with a lot of anxiety, but anytime I'm doing something with my hands, you go into that flow state where you don't think about anything else. Like I can't be stressed and wood carve. It's not possible. Um, when I'm doing it, I lose track of time. I'm fully, you know, invested in what I'm working in. So it is a, a stress relief for me. Um, it's also a, a source of extra income because I do sell a lot of my carvings, which is just an added bonus. Um, I'm not getting rich or living off of it by any means, but it's it's nice to have a little extra and then being able to upgrade my tools as I go. Um, a lot of people have asked me if I would still wood carve if I wasn't making money. And I tell them, yeah, I would, but probably not as much. Um, but I definitely think I still would because I just, I love giving them to people for free. Even I like having them around the house to display and show off. So I would still do it. Um, I don't know if I mentioned I am an elementary school teacher. I teach physical education. So that's why during the pandemic, I had a lot of extra time because we were home from school about six months and we were teaching Zoom school, which as a physical education teacher, you're not really doing much. Um, we basically would check in with the kids for 30 minutes and um, show them some videos to do and ideas of things they could do at home. But assuming that kids didn't have any kind of equipment or, you know, a lot of them at the time didn't even have access to internet. So it was a challenge, but that's one of the reasons why I started wood carving. Um, I have taught a few different groups of kids. I've never taught any adults. Uh, here in my hometown, I taught a group of homeschool kids, about 10 of them. And I suggested that we do soap carving, but the parents really insisted that they wanted the kids to actually do, do the actual wood carving with the knife. So I sent them a, a knife that they could order and gloves that they could order and the basswood they could order and they did that and it actually turned out really well none of the kids got hurt and they were able to carve little mushrooms and then our next se session they did little faces just a basic face so that was neat and then the school I teach at in Topeka we have a garden an outdoor garden that me and another teacher kind of maintain with a group of students um, and then through the summer, we meet for a couple hours a week. And I kind of lead the arts and crafts project each week. We do a different thing. And so I do soap carving with them. And I found a new awesome knife on Amazon. It's called Nathan's wood, Wooden Knife. Um, I meant to bring one, but I left it at work. But it's a folding pocket knife that's all wood. And you can take sandpaper and sharpen the edge to actually get a somewhat decently sharp edge. It works really well for soap. So if anyone's interested in teaching kids, I think that's a really good resource. Um, let's see. I do mainly sell on Etsy. I have done a few craft shows locally, um, but it, 
they to me they're kind of hit or miss i've been to some shows where i sit there all day and hardly sell anything and then other times i sell everything i came with so it's just hard to really determine what show is going to do well um I don't know that at this point I want to do any more shows because I've been really successful on Etsy. Thankfully, just about everything I've carved has sold on there eventually. Sometimes it might take a year. Sometimes it might sell quickly. But yeah, the craft shows are just a lot of work, you know, getting the tables and boxing your stuff up and displaying it and setting prices. And yeah, it's just a lot of work. So. And then sometimes you got to deal with the elements outside, the weather and the wind. And to me, it's just easier to sell on Etsy. Um, I started my Etsy about a year in, so in 2021. And I think it took almost a year to get my first sale. Um, and it was these little things. I don't have any of them anymore, but they're called... I call them little voodoo dolls. I guess I could share my screen and try to show you a picture. Let's see. I haven't made one in quite a while. But I remember when I made my first sale, because we were, me and my wife were at a hotel, we went. Uh, the kids went to my mother-in-law's and we went and just got a hotel and had plans to go see a show for Valentine's Day. And we were just hanging out in the hotel waiting for our taxi ride or whatever. And I got the little cha-ching on my phone and it was like the greatest feeling seeing my first sale. And it was only like $15. It wasn't anything big, but that first sale is awesome. And then since then, over the last couple of years, I've made I'm almost at 350 sales on Etsy. So I'm pretty proud of how well that's done. Gosh, I have a lot on here. Well, I don't know. At least you guys are getting a sense of kind of what my carvings look like. Somewhere in here. All right, here's an example of some Christmas ones. I put little Christmas hats on them because I did a haunted Christmas theme show, but that's what the little voodoo dolls look like. And so that was the first thing I ever sold. Um, I guess we could go way back and kind of see where I started from. So I did a lot of mushrooms. I did this little guy for my son, it was a, a video game that he was into called Rainbow Friends. And he's got little magnets on his arms so his arms could go up and down and move. That one was pretty cool. Um, there's a picture of me carving at one of the craft shows I did here in town. Um, I did avocado toast magnets. I kind of want to make those again. Those are kind of cool. But you can tell I have a lot of Halloween. I think around this time when I posted these is when I started really getting a lot of followers that are interested in my Halloween stuff. So that was October of 2022 is when I really got into Halloween stuff and realized how popular that was. Um, then we got to Christmas, one of the first big Santas I made, not Santa, snowmen. And I like doing, uh, on the snowmen, like I put white paint on a toothbrush and flick it and it makes it look like a snow effect on the, on the scarf and the hat. Um, so elf I did that I really loved. I ended up giving that to my uncle. A lot of gnomes, some birds, 
And this was the first chess set that I did. So I did a ghost chess set uh, last year. So I finished that February of last year. That was a daunting task. That took probably two solid months to finish. And I kept taking breaks in between because it just got really redundant carving 32 pieces or I think that's how many there are 32 pieces and then painting them and all that but that one I ended up selling on Etsy so that inspired me to do my second chess set that I just finished this year that I'll get to um, last year I did some Easter bunnies those sold pretty well a lot of different styles of those. And then I did these uh, mushroom houses that I really liked with the wooden doors and the stone. They have a lot of little detail on them, but people tend to like those a lot. More Halloween stuff. These ones, I got the idea of the spooky house from uh, I'm not sure how you say his name, but it's D Dallo Carver. He's on uh, Instagram and YouTube also. He does these spooky trees. So that was kind of my take on them. And then I added the pumpkin on top and the pumpkin was separate. It just sits on top. Uh, those are really popular. And then I did a version of them this year that I think are even way better that I'll get to. I did this Cardinal um, for a wedding gift. Now, when I got into doing these birds, because I don't have a very good bandsaw, my bandsaw was something that was given to me free and it can only cut about one inch thick successfully. If I try to go any bigger, it's it doesn't cut very straight and it has all kinds of problems. So I started using a Dremel, which I know some people consider cheating, but just doing the rough out stage with the Dremel saved me a ton of time on, especially with your horizontal cuts where you're going against the grain. So like on these birds. And this was a really cool period of my wood carving time. Cause if, as you can see here on the screen, these were sold to Jennifer Love Hewitt, the celebrity. So she was a popular movie star from when I was a kid. Um, I ended up sharing another artist's work on my Instagram stories who I guess uh, had been making art for Jennifer Love Hewitt. So she ended up posting something on her page and Jennifer saw it. And then next thing I know, I get a message from Jennifer Love Hewitt on my Instagram. And I'm like, this can't be real. And I showed it to my wife. She's like, well, it's verified. It looks like her and everything. And sure enough, it was. So I can't remember what she bought. She bought a couple of Santas at first, I think. And then I made these custom birds for her two, two children. And then since then, she's probably bought 15 to 20 more pieces from me. It's just kind of mind blowing. But I have this thing like, I don't understand it. Like, and there's been another celebrity that's been buying my stuff. I don't, I, but I don't understand it. I have like imposter syndrome because I'm thinking there's way better carvers out there than me. I don't understand why they're interested in my stuff, but they are. So it's, it's pretty awesome. That was definitely the highlight of my carving career so far was her reaching out and wanting to buy some stuff. Um, last year I did, finally did a full size Santa. That was my first attempt. Um, Cause I gotten really confident with my faces. Like this guy really loved his face. Um, and I went the longest time without carving eyes. Uh, this is one of the first ones I actually did eyes on. And I really liked how it turned out. So I continued doing some full Santas and I loved how these guys turned out. I started making their beards bigger and bigger and longer and curlier until they ended up looking like this little mushroom hat Santa, the big curl. Um, this one's a little bit different. He's got a Christmas tree hat. 
another type of Christmas tree hat. I really like how that one turned out. And he's got hands behind his back, kind of crossed. So I don't think you can ever make too many Santas. And this was kind of a Christmas colored gnome that I did around the same time last year. So you can hey, Cody, kind of um, yeah. Dave Rungan wanted to know if you could share the black speckled rabbit that you've done. Black speckled rabbit. Um, not sure. Was that something that you had seen on this page when I was scrolling? There's this guy. That was yes, it was, it, was one, it was one of the first ones. One of the first ones. Let's see. Um, I believe the first rabbit I did was these guys. Is that one? Not sure. Yeah, I think it was before the the um, psychedelic one here on the left. It was before that. I mean, you went through it real quick, but I, I saw it and I, wow, that's really impressive. Hmm. But I mean, if you can't go to it, um, don't worry about it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm, sorry, I'm not sure. That's all good. Does anyone have any other questions on any of these pieces they've seen? Hey, Cody, do you want to talk a little bit about your paint process? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I, I think the uh, rabbit again, but. Yeah, I think the one that he's talking about is. Uh, oh, right here we close. go. Maybe yeah. that's it. Yeah, so this one I tried to paint like. Yeah, that's rocks. it. Yeah. Oh, that's a different one. Do the same thing with the toothbrush? Yeah, so what I did on this one is I took kind of like a little, uh, I think they're used for makeup, like a makeup sponge. So I painted all black and then I sponged on blue, red, and violet kind of in a diagonal. Yeah, I kind of just dabbed it diagonally in different rows and then kind of blended all together. And then once that was dried, yeah, I put water down white on a toothbrush and flick the bristles with my thumb and just have it splatter like that to make the star yes. effect. But yeah, it's the exact same thing I do when I do the snow effect on uh, the hats and stuff like that. Yeah, nice I'm job. Gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing here in a second. Uh, let's see, so I can show you some here in person. So. With the painting process, um, as soon as I get done carving, I'll uh, wash off any water, or sorry, wash off any pencil marks with water and soap if needed. Um, most of the time I don't have pencil marks, so um, I don't sand any of my work. I like the, the roughness, the texture that the knife leaves, so I don't ever do sanding. Um, then I will coat it, once it's dry, I'll coat it in linseed oil and let it sit at least a day before I try to paint it. I know a lot of people just paint straight onto the wood and I tried that at first, but I like how it looks with the oil first. I think the paint goes on a little bit more even and smoothly. Um, I'll water down my paint about 50-50. So like a drop of paint and a drop of water. I use a little uh, dropper for the water. Um, and then I'll probably do, if I'm gonna paint something solid, like for example, this, you can't see the wood grain through this at all. 
I know it's kind of hard to see on the, if I adjust my light. So this is what I would call a solid painting. So that's probably two to three coats um, on that. But recently I've gotten into doing just really light um, brushes like on this Santa. So you can just barely tell it's a little bit wider on the beard than the face. And then I left the face natural and then just lightly brush the hat with red. And I really like how these Santas look. And honestly, it's a hell of a lot easier for me because it saves so much time. I don't have to do one coat and let it dry and another coat and let it dry. So that's another one that I just lightly brushed. So recently I've gotten into that. Um, but I think that works well on the Santas and snowmen. But if I was still doing something like these past Easter bunnies, I definitely want the more bold colors. But yeah, that's about all I got for painting. I do like doing um, a dry brush layer on top just to really show the texture. It's really hard to see on this camera, but I've dry brushed over this blue with white just to make the texture stand out. Sometimes I'll paint little details on the hat, like these little snowflakes and on the scarf. Here's an example of the snow effect I did on that snowman. Um, see if there's anything on my notes. So I get a lot of inspiration from Instagram, but it's kind of a fine line between like getting inspiration and then copying someone. So I know that if you've seen the carver called Would You Mind on Instagram, I know this is very much like his style, this bunny. Um, but I try not to completely imitate and I'm still working on finding my own style, um, but it is difficult. I would say that I'm on that path now. You know, when I first started, I was copying Doug Linker's videos, just step by step, completely copying. And then once I understand the basic process, then I made, you know, his little hobo guy in my style or his Santa in my style. Um, but it's still difficult to not want to copy people. Um, and I think it's fine to copy people and give them credit, but I, I would feel weird about selling something that I feel like I've copied. So it's kind of a fine line, but there are awesome carvers on Instagram, like Alex Joyner, his Santas are amazing. Would you mind uh, Tony's carvings? Yeti Rage, like there's just so many awesome artists on Instagram. So I get a lot of inspiration from them. Um, I guess I could talk about my tools. So one confession I have is I am terrible at sharpening my knives. I, and I've been, you know, for years trying all these different methods. And then I think my knives are good. And then just recently I got this from flex cut the carving jack and this made me realize how terribly dull all the rest of my knives were because this thing is so so super sharp so for the past month i'd say i've just been obsessing about getting all my knives sharpened to to try to get them to be like this because this thing is awesome so right now since my other knives are trying to get reworked this is about 90 percent of what i use is this carving jack. And then I'll use some of the other uh, flex cut gouges like the V and the U. Um, I think these are the minis. And then I also use the micros. I don't really go much bigger than that because everything I carve is like less than two inches across, sometimes three. Um, I do have one bigger palm tool that comes in handy sometimes, but yeah, the majority of them are just this carbon jack and then a couple gouges. 
Uh, like I said, I use the Dremel for rough out, um, but that's typically on, only on bigger pieces like the, the Santas and the Snowman. I don't use it for that, but something like these guys, it really comes in handy to get this, this little slope where it goes out on the edges and out down here, especially if you're doing something like this guy is so much bigger. If I were to try to carve this 100% with just a knife, it would take me days, but I can rough it out in probably 20 minutes and then have the other details done in, in an hour or so. Using the Dremel has been a lifesaver because I'm really trying to get into more bigger things. So like this little guy, this year I did this one. So he's about four times the size. And so I definitely use the Dremel to try to work down this one. And on these guys, I attach the, the tail and the ears separately. And then the head and the body is all one piece. Uh, it's another one I just finished. It's a spilled ice cream cone. So I use the Dremel on this one as well to get the rough shape. And then my carbon jack to do all the detail. If anyone's familiar with where I'm from, Lawrence, Kansas, we have the Jayhawks. So I carve Jayhawks to sell here locally, these little guys. And so our chant is rock chalk Jayhawk. So I made a Jayhawk that looks like it's made out of rock and painted with chalk. That was my kind of play on words, the rock chalk Jayhawk. I also did a haunted house that has some extra details added. What's that? Oh, I thought someone had a question. So this one has a lot of detail. It has this rock wall, goes all the way up. Um, then the chimney, the ghosts, and the graveyard are all carved and attached separately. But this, of all the things I've made, this one probably took the longest, um, not considering the chest set, because the chest set is a whole different thing. That's like 32 carvings. Show you what that looks like. This is the one I just finished. So they're ghosts, but I instead of painting, I use two different types of wood. So I use basswood and butternut, and then just oil them. I didn't catch what they said. Yeah, I think somebody just unmuted on accident. Okay. Um, gosh, I don't know if I have any more notes here. If anyone has any questions. Hey, Cody, you talked a lot about using the Dremel. Is there certain bits that you use to be able to do that if somebody you know doesn't want to use knives or whatever to, to rough out with. Do you have something you recommend? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I ended up buying the flex shaft. And so it's an extension that goes on the end. And then the, the piece that holds the bit is actually like the size of a pin almost. It's tiny. So you can, it's a lot easier to hold than the actual, because the Dremel's like that big around. It's like, you know, holding a baseball bat in your hand, but as opposed to a pin. And then I use the bit I use as a cut saw. Um, it's like a cylinder shaped. Uh, it's the roughest one they have, the cut saw. So it's basically like metal barbs kind of all around this cylinder. Um, and it takes off material quickly. So you really got to be careful of your fingers <laughs> when you're doing it. But really, you're using the same motions you would as if you were using a knife. 
So I'm, I'm pulling or, you know, just like I, as if I had a knife in my hand, I'm using the exact same motions, the same muscles. So it's kind of like muscle memory. You just got to remember to keep your hands out of the way, like you would carving with a knife, but yeah, it's powerful and it, it does save a ton of time. I recommend everyone. So I don't have any kind of dust collection or system, anything in my house. So I do it outside and I still wear a respirator, even if I'm outside, because it produces a lot of dust and you'll be covered head to toe in it. So I bought a real good respirator to wear because that stuff can be dangerous. So yeah, I'll do the rough out with that and then go over it with a knife so you don't see any of the, the roughness from the Dremel. And then I'll go in and do all the detail work after that. Um, and primarily, like I said, now I use flex cut. I also wanted to mention um, Beckwith Forge on Instagram makes really awesome knives. So I bought one of his, um, it's beautiful. It's like a work of art and super sharp. And unfortunately, it's one of the ones I've doled up and I need to rework it, but still learning. So I ended up buying some of these diamond coated plates and I'm going to try with oil um, from a video I saw on YouTube. Because I, as of now, I just have been using a strop, but I also tried using sandpaper, but I don't think I knew what I was doing. And I think I made my knives more dull than where they begin. So. I'm still learning on that part. That's been the hardest challenge for me for sure is keeping my knives sharp. And Cody, when you are talking about painting there a few minutes ago, I don't know if you, you said it or not, but it, do you do anything to finish them? Do you put on like a lacquer? Um, oh, yeah. Any kind of wax or anything? Um, so typically I'll just do another coat of lin oil, linseed oil with, I'll mix in some burnt umber like uh, oil paint, especially on my Halloween ones, like these guys. It's really hard to tell in the camera, but I do the burnt umber to really darken it up, especially the, the creases and the cracks, they get darker. Um, but on something like, oh, like my pastel bunnies that I want to be bright, I won't do any kind of stain on those with the linseed oil and then i recently got into cottonwood bark i'm going to share my screen again one more time to show you those and on those i didn't like how the linseed oil looked finishing those so i ended up buying uh, the feed and wax so it's like beeswax and orange oil so this guy right here. So I finished that one with uh, beeswax and orange oil, the feed and wax. And I really liked how that turned out because that, that cottonwood bark just soaks up the oil so much that when I did the linseed oil after a day, you couldn't even tell that I put any oil on it. It just soaked everything up. So the beeswax sits on top a little bit better. Um, and then I recently got into making some keychains and and necklaces and earrings, like these guys right here. And these ones I ended up finishing with a lacquer to hopefully protect the, the paint if they were getting dinged up against keys and whatnot. So I've used a, a lot of different things, but primarily just the linseed oil if they're just gonna be sitting on someone's countertop, if it's basswood, so. You can see a little bit better what I'm what I was talking about with the light, just a real light brushing on these guys. I really like how that turned out. As opposed to my this is what I would call like solid painting, where you can't see the grain. But I I love keeping the face unpainted on most of them because I like people to know that it's wood. Like you can see the grain in the face, and I think that's cool. So that's something I've kind of always done. But it's always cool looking back on your old stuff. I mean, even comparing my wood carvings last year to this year, I can see a huge difference. You can tell in this video. 
So last year was just kind of a bland, not a lot of texture in it. And then this year, it's just on a whole different level. And a lot of that had to do with dry brushing. On these guys, I dry brushed with a white over top. And I think that really made it pop and make it look like wood more so than last year. Are there a brand of paints that you like to use? Yeah, I use primarily the folk art plaid, plaid crafts, I think they're called. Um, I've tried the, I think they're under the same brand, like the Apple Barrel, but I didn't like those as much as the plaid. I think the plaid are a little bit higher end. Um, I've tried a couple other ones from Michaels or wherever that were four times the price, but it didn't, the price increase didn't seem worth it to me. So the plaid works for what I need. So uh, tell everybody where they can find your work. Uh, what's the Instagram handle and where else can they find you? Sure. So it's block underscore and or knives on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I also post sometimes on TikTok, although I don't fully understand it. I don't, I don't look at it. I don't look at TikTok. I don't scroll through it like I do with Instagram but I will post on there every once in a while and it just doesn't make sense to me because sometimes I'll get like 200 likes within 30 seconds and then other times I won't get any likes. It just seems like it's all bots, like not real people on TikTok. So I don't post as much on there. Instagram is my primary one. Um, then you can find my link to my Etsy through that Instagram or Facebook. Um, it's block and knife on Etsy, but I don't think you can get to my page by just typing in block and knife on, if you go to Etsy, cause it's just going to give you a bunch of knife blocks that people are trying to sell. So the easiest way is to find the link through my Instagram. And even if I always tell people, even if you're not interested in buying anything, at least if you can go to my page and favorite it and like some of the stuff I make and that helps drive more traffic even if you're not necessarily buying something that's one way to help I tell my friends and family to do the same so no question any in the chat there any other soap, soap carvings yeah um I typically I've only done the the mushroom and a face because I only have them for about 30 minutes um, once a year and it's a different group every year so it doesn't make sense to try to go <coughs> advance in that so yeah that's all I got on that mushrooms just seem like the easiest thing for me to start with and they seem to enjoy it so All right. Any other questions for Cody? Anybody have anything they want to uh, want to ask him? All right, Cody. Well, we appreciate you coming in and sharing, taking time out to uh, to show us your carvings. I'm a big fan. I've been following you for a while on Instagram, and uh, want to go out and check out your Etsy page to see what all you have out there. So. Uh, if anybody's interested in stuff that you've seen today, make sure you go out on Etsy and check it out. He's got stuff available there. Uh, and if he doesn't have a whole lot or have something you're looking for, you can probably reach out and contact him. Uh, Cody, I just want to say thank you again for sharing. Without uh, presenters like yourself, we're not able to have these meetings. So uh, it's nice to have uh, new people come on and share and talk a little bit about what got you into carving and, uh, and see your journey. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Just want to remind you all, we'll be meeting again next Saturday, the 25th. Uh, Reese from Woody Wood Spirits is going to be on. Uh, then we'll be going to our summer series again, like I said earlier. Uh, the next meeting will be June 22nd after next weekend. So a uh, little bit of time space there. I'm going to take a vacation. Uh, wanted to let you all know, Dave Levy's not with us today because he's taking a little time off. It's his anniversary. So he's spending time with his wife today out having a good time and, uh, 
he'll still be doing the editing and stuff behind the scenes after this meeting. But uh, it's always nice for all of us to take a little time off. Uh, so hopefully Dave's having a good day. Uh, rem remember to uh, contact Dave Stetson if you're interested in his class. Again, it's coming up June 1st. Uh, if you're um, if you're curious about what's offered in the class, uh, go out and sign up for Wood Carving Academy. Uh, check out their offerings out there. A lot of the classes that have been held in the past have been recorded and they're available out there by subscription. A lot of Dave stuffs out there. I've been in his classes. You'll see every cut that Dave makes in that class. So make sure you try to go out and sign up for that. Uh, it'll really benefit you as far as your uh, your progress goes with carving. So. Uh, just want to thank you all for coming in today. Thank you uh, again, Cody, for sharing. Uh, this has been the International Association of Woodcarvers, and we will see you all next Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.